Well, hi, this is John from the Driveway Garden, and we haven't been around for quite a few weeks. Life, certain things in life just get in the way. But we're going to start an update and just start from where we are. And we're in my hog panel garden right now, which we have modified. And so now it's, you know, it's really tall, all five foot, four inches of me. And it looks kind of empty. Well, past couple of years, I've had fantastic results in here with all the brassicas and got the netting to keep the butterfly off for the worms that get on the brassicas and that works beautifully. But with all the heat and moisture this year, uh, I check this about every three days because I know how the watering goes in this. And so it was a three day period later on the third day and uh, after a few rains through that time, uh, it finally caught up because all of a sudden I had tremendous amount of slug damage. You can still see some in my Napa plants right here, which I planted just a few weeks ago, but they're, they're beating it and coming out of it. And then, uh, but on that third day, it was just an explosion of aphids. Uh, the aphids were so profuse on there that the leaves started to get contorted. And then I had moles coming under all the plants, which I have worked on eliminating as well. So I had slugs and aphids and moles I had to rip out three quarters of my brassica, and that's it gets a little disappointing after all that effort. But I replanted, I got some cauliflower, some napa, and some other cabbages, which were from a mix, so I don't know those varieties. But I did plant some of my Italian onions right here. And so I'm gonna start using this space for a few other things. I've got a few other brassicas going on my garage side garden, which are look a little beat up, but they're growing fine. So I'm not totally out of brassicas, but this part was really disappointing. But next we're gonna take a look at the garlic. Well, here we are uh, with my Chestnut Red Hardneck Garlic. You can see the scapes were pruned off so that we didn't get seed. We ate those, they were delightful. And so we're gonna harvest ones who are how we're doing. This is the first year I grew garlic, so I tried it in different places. And kind of gotta remember that in my yard, I, I have nooks and crannies and micro environments all over because I don't have a lot of space. So I try different areas which you might not usually try. So let's take a look and see what we got here. And garlic feels pretty good. It is really in there nicely growing. I was hoping for big heads, but we'll see how we do. Uh, well, you know, medium, medium, not bad. It's forming cloves, but not like I would like it. So at this point, I am gonna leave it in, even though it's we're in second week of July, uh, a lot of people are harvesting already, but I'm gonna leave these in a little longer, I think another week or two. And the other thing I hear on garlic uh, when I'm watching online is all kinds of comments of when to harvest. They all seem to work. Uh, uh, got guys in Europe say just when it's totally green, you can harvest. I saw three different videos where they all have a different count of leaves when they harvest, but I think that's also variety oriented. So you just gotta really pay attention, observe this crop, to see what it's doing, at least for my part, in my different types of micro environments. So this is snow, snow hill garlic right here, and this is the chestnut red I just harvested, which is not big enough by any means. And you can just look at the difference. So uh, microclimates make a difference. I mean, just a few feet away, these are growing okay, and I think I'll end up with some good heads of garlic. I'm not so sure on the snow hill but we're gonna let that ride a little longer than usual and see how they work out. Let's check that other area where we planted both varieties. Well, we're in my backyard area now, and you can see even here, they haven't grown as well. And there's a little less light here, but it gets good, bright, and dappled light. But we're gonna harvest one just to see what it looks like. And let's take a look. And this is one of, one of the snow hills ask actually and we know that's going to be sm small and not the way you want it but we're just going to look at it so we know what's going on yeah so you know it's beginning i can feel the cloves and even this is usable uh but you certainly want it bigger than that it'd be nice to have you know bigger half dollar size or something bigger but uh we're just going to find out the best areas and this is the way to experiment for it uh, I'm going to leave these in too. We'll see how it goes and we'll update. Well, here we are by my dewatered manure pile. Remember, no smell. There is no smell. It's a beautiful thing. Manure is a beautiful thing. 
So look what look at this pumpkin. This is one of those knucklehead pumpkins. It's called knucklehead. And I put those in my winter compost. And of course that and it really heats it up. So my winter compost averaged about 131, 131 degrees through the winter. That kills all seeds, right? This is knucklehead uh, pumpkin. It's called knucklehead. And I got them growing in several places. And all it does is it really helps the seed. Uh, it wears it down just to help it germinate better is what it does. It's huge. I mean, that's 20 feet long. And we got a nice one started here. And this might take over part of my lawn too, but it makes it kind of fun. So pumpkin seeds get nicely conditioned to germinate really well and grow well in your compost pile. Knucklehead. Well, hello there again. Hey, so I'm looking at my Melibar, or what's called climbing spinach. This is another one. We'll get into some more detail in the coming videos. But it's been really good. I've been eating it. And what I like on it, see those really nice purple stems and how they wrap together. And they go up around the trail. So it's also a very beautiful plant. And when I eat this, I'm going to try one right now. Mm, very watery. Kind of a mild, nutty taste. Something like that, but good, very good. So, great on BLTs. I also have a unique thing. You wanna come around here, Brandon. I, I never grew this one, it's called Egyptian spinach. And um, let's see here, let's just try it. You're supposed to be able to eat the leaves of that. Just a very mild flavor, hard to describe, but tastes fine. Uh, but it's really mild, tastes good. I never had it before. We'll talk about more about that and some recipes coming up on that. So in here, also, we got some bur uh, burgundy beans and some green beans. These are my Italian green beans I bought seeds on. Uh, this is the Dorani squash. We got another one on here. We already picked a few of those. And we have our cube of butter. There's a nice little one back here. I don't know if you can see that, Brandon. But there's oh, yeah. one one there and a few more little ones started. Did you get it? Yep. Okay. Here we're trying something new again too called Amaranth Red Garnet. And I had a pro real problem with these. The slugs and pill bugs love these things, especially small. And I put them in small. I'm wondering how, you know, a lot of times, how do you get them to grow with all these insects problem? The heat and the moisture has really uh, ac accentuated the insect problem this year. I took uh, this from Biominerals, a place where I get some other product we'll talk about in the future. But they, they give me, I got a bag of uh, micronutrients, has 75 micronutrients in it. So I took a small pondful of that along with some of Spoma Garden Tone, which is a totally natural organic fertilizer. And I took both of those, blended them, and put them about a four inch uh, swath around the seedlings when they were smaller. And my, my thinking was, is a lot of these insects don't like a lot of nutrition. So it definitely did slow the pill bugs and slugs down. And you can see the result. So try different things in your garden. Now what I'll get with the amaranthus is grain. You can also eat the foliage of this. Actually, there's kind of a sweet, slight sweet, bitter flavor to it. I like it. Hmm. But you can eat that too. But the idea would be to get enough grain to make a loaf of bread. Well, I don't have room for that. So I'm just going to try this and see what I get out of it. And I'm going to actually try to process what grain is there. I'm going to show you one plant that's in flower next. Okay, well, I started this amaranth in February. And um, so it has a head start against the other one. So I know better how to handle it. So next year I am gonna to try to make an area big enough so where maybe I can make a loaf of bread or two. But even if I don't, I have the foliage is okay to eat. And uh, I love it, it's a beautiful plant. So I love it just for the beauty too. So we'll, we'll try something different next year and see if we can make some bread. Oh, 
Jeez. Man, that really hurts. Who thinks of thorns on eggplants? Well, why would you touch it? Well, just be quiet, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so these plants right here, this bodacious tomato from Burpee Hybrid, indeterminate, eggplant fairy tale, and the pepper here, I all overwintered. Now, I started a tomato from seed in February, but these I all overwintered, and I also have a Swiss chard that's in the ground there, we'll show briefly. And you can see there's good production on this little plant. I mean, you got one, two, three, four, five nice medium-sized peppers on this little thing. But it's not growing anymore. It's not getting any bigger. And there's actually quite a few fruits on the eggplant. So it's grown okay. And there was about five on here as well. And here I got about 11 tomatoes. But it's interesting how these are growing. I'll just take the tomato, for example. It's set fruit. We got 11 fruits on there. But once it set this fruit, it stopped growing, and I haven't seen it flower. And I, it might be a re reaction of the over or having it grown on so early. Uh, I'm not really sure on that. But in the end, I'm getting production, but it isn't worth it overwintering. I had a lot of people from church and various people asking me, so I just thought I'd prove it to them. Um, I didn't think it would work, but you can be sure it doesn't. So these are some of the fruits on my champion tomato, which is a hybrid indeterminate tomato plant. And there, there are 15 medium size uh, tomatoes on there right now. And you can see they're starting to ripen. So production is great. And we've had the weather because it's been warm since early April and sometimes even hot in late April, and early May, which is highly unusual. And I didn't have to deal with one frost. So I did put things out really early. So I noticed them starting to stress in the heat. And let's take a look at this, this a minute, Brandon. Um, this is the netting. I had this over them. And of course, they're starting to get too tall for it. So what I'm doing is we're going to develop a way to put it over. But this red net, netting does a lot of different things. Keeping it cool is the big, biggest thing I'm looking for. But I picked this type because it has an effect on what it does with the sun rays. That'll be in a coming video. We'll get some detail on that. And we'll show you how we constructed the, to put the netting over the tomatoes. So you can see our peppers are producing rather well, and most of them are doing the same kind of thing. So it's, this has really been, well, I guess I better not point a knife at you, huh? So these smaller containers, we have some experiments going here, which we'll talk to you in the next video about. There's three different types of things we're doing there. Uh, over here, uh, these size of containers often are the size that uh, people want to use. I have the larger containers which I have to, don't have to add extra fertilizers and things per se. But smaller containers don't have enough mass of soil. I do keep topping with compost, which works pretty good. But there's a lot of questions out there. How can they do it without all the composting? Well, these products right here from Build a Soil. This one's called Build a Veg. And this one is called Big Six. And briefly, uh, basically, this has pure fish protein, it has soy protein, which is a non-GMO. It has beneficial organisms, soluble humic acid, and a few other things. We'll get into the detail on that on the next video. And then there's this one has humic acid, and it has six of the most common micronutrients not found in soil tests by Build the Soil. And they say they've done thousands of tests. Well, I'm going to do an experiment combining both these products. And these products are perfect for those who have two, three, 10, 20 pots, not like me where I have over a hundred. So look for that video. We'll get into detail. So what we're looking at here are some peppers, multiple varieties that we've got from another YouTuber named Chili Chump. And we figured we'd try some of his seeds out this year. These, a number of these varieties are some that he's found another, and a couple others are hybrids that he's made. But John's going to talk about what we're doing with them. Yeah, so what we did is with the Chili Chump varieties, which, which he names a lot of these, right, Brandon? Yeah, anytime there's a CC on the end, that okay, so that's what it is. Chili so, Chump. Okay, so. all right, very good. So uh, what we did here is the terracotta pots. We use this product right here called Bigfoot. And actually, I want, Brandon, I want to get a shot of this side too. See, because it lists all those nice things at the top. So... Um, Anyway, this has just one beneficial variety, um, and it's a beneficial fungus, but it also has the biochar, kelp, worm casting, and humic acid. 
all those things are great things that will get the biology going in the soil along with the biology in this. So I put this on the terracotta pots and it's just my straight compost on the black pots. So, you know, it's July 8th. They look a lot the same at this point. This pot's a little smaller, but initially the volume is really close to what's in here. Right now they look a lot the same. There's a few differences and I haven't seen a lot of differences in, in the, any of the immediate growth yet, but let's see how it goes as they mature and produce and we'll see, compare the difference with using this with my compost and just straight compost. So stay tuned. Okay, the, these right here are gherkin cucumbers. I started getting production on that two weeks ago. And then on the other side, I have Boston. Right here is one. Boston pickling. They're both pickling cukes. But the gherkin started, well, about two and a half weeks earlier than the Boston. They were planted, germinated at the same time, planted at the same time. So that was really nice. I got early on from here and I'm still getting production and now I'm getting production from here as well. So very good varieties, gherkin and Boston pickling. So why would we pot up smaller plants into larger containers and then finally into the ground? Well, there's actually a couple aspects we can look at that. Um, one for me is especially is that I wanna keep eating this stuff. So the lettuce, the mustards, uh, other, other types of things, spinach. I'll keep growing these even from early spring. Now, all these are gonna bolt. We know they go to flower. And a lot of what I hear is, is that they just don't produce after that. Well, they do produce some. And I also am very much like, here's a red mustard very much in flower. This will come down pretty soon, but I find the flowers delightful too. So yeah, nice mustard taste. And I, I'm doing this with several of my crops and I find it delightful for salads and stuff. And of course I have to keep germinating more seeds of spinach and mustards and so on. And, but I do, and I keep eating that because we know the best time to plant is probably about the first week of August. Then you don't deal with the bolting and a lot of these types of things will overwinter at that point, which I would do as well. But in this fashion, I can start eating typically in March, harvesting spinach and different things like that through the whole summer. And then I plant some that will overwinter and then I have early spring and so on. So that's why I pot on in that way. Such olfactory delight and a feast for the eyes. Thank you for watching the driveway garden.